So, as already stated, my name is Adrian. Uh, I'm a senior security researcher with Ixia's application and threat intelligence team. And uh, this presentation is, is entitled Applying Fuzzy Phishing to Phishing Page Identification. So if that's not all the words I'll keep clear, I'll just try to make them clear as we go along. And onwards. Some stuff about me, I spend most of my time working with uh, malware, with honeypots and stuff like that, but as you might assume, I also tend to play with phishing sometimes. Identification, of course. And you can follow me on Twitter if you like what uh, I'm going to talk about here. So, I assume everyone in this room here knows what phishing is. We also tend to assume our users know what phishing is. Everyone has to go through regular corporate trainings, awareness campaigns, and stuff like that. Well, I'd just like to talk to you about a bit about the definition of phishing to underline a couple of important points. So what someone who does phishing tries, using a web page in this case, is to gain the user's trust so that they will reveal some sort of information that's important to them. Uh, the best way to do that is to use graphical <coughs> markings and stuff like that. Send the phishing page out to as many people as possible, and then hopefully they will send something useful. So if you're wondering why I worked with this, uh, the reason was that we tried to maintain an IP and domain reputation database, and uh, you've probably seen phishing URLs before, and might be wondering why uh, bother, since you can generally tell from the phishing URL. Of course, we know users don't generally tell from the phishing URLs. You might also wonder, after I'm done presenting, why I wouldn't go with something like uh, using word-based identification, some sort of word cloud, and if you look at the URLs behind me, you can probably see, well, you, there's Google Doc in there, there's uh, uh, Gmail inside. You can probably tell it's a phishing page. But the truth is, a lot of people don't. And we also have this rule where we definitely want to find out that something hosts a phishing page. So not just rely on the assumption that if there's a URL that looks like phishing, there's definitely phishing over there. So to improve the detection of our uh, phishing, I decided to look into the current state of the art in research and uh, saw a lot of people talking about visual hashing. Visual hashing mean ta means taking an image and then trying to generate a stream of bytes, preferably something that you can compare to another stream of bytes from a different image and then say these things have about the same content, there are some similarities. Okay? My idea was, well, you know, phishing relies on that whole graphical marker thing to gain trust. Most likely this, sh this should work. That was my expectation. I tested it with login pages such as these, and lo and behold, it actually did work. And then I began to run into the limitations of this approach. First one I saw was rendering failure. So when you access a website, sometimes you get stuff that doesn't load for whatever reason. We all, we've all been there, right? With phishing, that's even more pervasive since uh, phishing pages and their resources sometimes get taken offline. So they might not be able to load an image from somewhere. Then you have the usual network hiccups from the ISPs. And then from time to time, a headless browser you're using simply doesn't render in the allotted time. And you might say, yes, but a legitimate user wouldn't probably be fooled by these. So I shouldn't have to worry about these. But sometimes you have incomplete failures. What happens if only five of those images get loaded instead of all six of them? Someone might actually say, OK, looks safe. I'll just insert my credentials in here. So this was one of the reasons I decided with no-go on this. The other one is that thanks to the magic of HTML and CSS, you can actually do very small modifications to a phishing page and obtain a completely different uh, visual result. Like in this case, simply changing the URL of a CSS uh, URL parameter, you can just go with a completely different background. Again, first idea is yes, but uh, I for one, one human can definitely tell that's about the same thing, it's a login page. But a simple visual hashing algorithm can't know that. If I go with something more advanced, it might be able to say, yeah, there's some sort of background and a big green blob in the middle, and this one also has a green blob in the middle, so pretty similar. But the more and more you go into um, visual hashing and image processing, things get more and more resource intensive. And since we're talking about something that has to work at scale, the basic idea is it has to work correctly as best as possible. And it also has to be dirt cheap when it comes in terms of computation. 
So I decided to give up on this approach and then went back to the assumptions of the fish phishing process. So an author tries to create a login page template, then deploys it at scale, and then at the end will finally profit from this. The idea is deploying at scale generally implies automation. I'm not just going to SCP on one million websites and copy stuff from place to place. And automation generally means I will have to give up at some point on adding too much randomness to make sure things continue working. What kind of randomness can I have in an HTML page? When well, in phishing pages, I've seen a couple of examples. The first one on top is a form action. So when you have a login form, it has to have an action property that says, where am I sending the data to be processed for this form? And if you're going to deploy stuff on different servers, the form action will change from place to place. Sometimes uh, authors also use uh, specialized cloning tools, and these, especially in their free forms, tend to add comments. Like you see the second one, not the, the second one, the blue one, that says mirrored from somewhere, also has a timestamp inside, so when I'm dealing with, with the HTML source, this will change from page to page. There are also some websites that, when cloned, have copyright information at the bottom. One author might be using a template that he generated in 2014, the other one from 2015, but most of the page stays the same. And like I said, the other trick with simply changing one of the URLs, referencing one of the necessary resources. So the idea is to find a hashing algorithm that will ignore these small differences. If you work in security, you're aware of hashing and mostly cryptographic hashing, which has this uh, security requirement that when I make modifications, that will imply a lot of randomness in the final hash because I don't want to be able to tell what was changed in the, in the stuff that was hashed, right? That would be a uh, grave danger to security. Fuzzy hashes, on the other hand, they don't work exactly the same. They have some statistical probabilities of doing stuff. And what I found was that some have a, pro a property, let's call it lo locality, that works, works something like this. When I make a modification in the input, in one place in the file, it will be output in a similar location in the hash. So that if in the input file I make a modification in the beginning, the modification will be at the beginning of the hash. Same goes for the end of the two. Uh, you can see these two examples. So they're both fake uh, Microsoft credential login pages. And using this approach, they have very similar source code. One of them simply has some uh, form action stuff URL to be submitted different in the beginning, and they have some uh, copyright information in the end and a timestamp. So using those two, the hash gets modified, but it gets modified only just a bit. So now I have a method of saying how different these things two are. When I can say how different they are, I can say they're, they're about the same, they have a distance in between, and distance means I can actually go ahead and do clustering of the stuff. So these are clusters obtained using some phishing pages that I found as templates, so the base idea goes as this. Find as many phishing pages as possible, generate signatures for them, try to cluster them together, and create signature packs of sorts that you will there compare new phishing pages towards. And then you can use this to classify. Uh, if you're wondering about efficiency, this, uh, this approach works pretty well. I haven't had it have any false positive while I was testing. Uh, the way we use it is also to correlate with other detection methods, both uh, commercial and privately developed. And we've had an increase in the number of detections thanks to having this good extra vote. Overall, it's been worth my time investigating this, and it's been a lot of fun just to poke around seeing phishing pages at work. That's it for me. This was a lightning talk, so I have to keep it short. If you guys have any questions. Okay, thank you so much, Alian. We do have time for questions, so let's check if we have. Just a quick one right here. Have you thought about using machine learning to detect such pages? Uh, yes, we do have a phishing engine trained using machine learning, and it does have some good results. Of course, it does have some bad results from place to place. Uh, we've used it, and uh, it's been successful. Is, is so, it uh, a supervised uh, model or is it an unsupervised Yes, model? it's a supervised model that we've trained before. We use the data we detect from time to time that we know has been validated and then do 
be training using that to be able to detect more and more stuff. Cool, cool. Because this looks to me like an unsupervised uh, machine learning approach. Uh, like well, it's not machine it. learning. Course, it's practically course, yeah. signature based. It might work, but I haven't actually tried applying this. Cool. Thanks. Thank we you. have another one here. Adrian, I'm here. Oh, there you go. Yeah, as I saw this, you kind of compared HTML source code. Yeah, that's it. So what if somebody like minifies it, but with a random class generation pattern? So it would be kind of different. Uh, I've and seen still maybe look exactly the same. Yeah, I thought about that idea. Actually, you know, fuzzy hashes have been used for malware detection up until one point where packing became so often that uh, the approach simply did not work. Uh, right now, there's not that much that I can see for phishing. Uh, there is a trick that I've seen where they basically generate an empty page, add some JavaScript code, and the JavaScript co code calls some AS encrypted blob. Actually, there were two instances. One said AS do AS decrypt, something like that, and the truth was they were XORing with one byte. But I guess it was just to scare people away from analyzing. And the other one actually used an open JavaScript implementation of AES where they use decryption on the fly. Uh, the thing is, most of that stuff, most of the encrypted blob was grabbed from somewhere else. And that minimal content that, they, that I had from the original phishing page was actually enough to classify stuff like that. Because what I have right there is just like you have for malware, those generic uh, cryptor, packer, or whatnot detections. Basically, I'm, de I'm detecting this approach of being used. And there aren't too many websites which would have a legitimate reason of doing some of this. They could add much more randomness if they want to, I guess. But so far, it works. So it definitely won't work indefinitely. So. OK, thank you so much, Adrian. Thank you.